This is a production of PBS Charlotte. In Gastonia, North Carolina, a town rich in textile history, it might seem like an unusual location for a polar bear, Costa Rican leafcutter ants, and giant octopus. And you might be asking yourself, how does this have anything to do with history? Well, it's natural history, and? Well, natural history is the scientific study of the natural world. Plants, animals, minerals, geology. That's all the ingredients needed to make up what you'll find at the Shield Museum of Natural History. My grandmother would bring me to the Shield Museum, and I would be four or five years old, and I would stand in front of these two black bears that look to me like they're ready to rip each other apart. With unique collections, a planetarium and live animals, plus a talented staff. So this is Cornelius. Uh, he is a corn snake. The Shield Museum welcomes more than 100,000 visitors a year, and it all started with one couple's unique hobby. We would not be here without those foundational collections that Mr. and Mrs. Shield brought to Gaston County that allowed our, our museum to begin. We'll explore the Shield Museum of Natural History, learn the story behind how this museum came to life, and meet the people that carry its legacy while keeping it relevant in the era of at-your-fingertips information. That's all coming up on Trail of History. The term history often conjures up thoughts of dates and famous people you had to remember back in school. But what about the natural world around us? To me, natural history, it's a, it's a traditional term, and I, I really like the use of natural history at our museum. Tony Paysauer is referring to the Shield Museum of Natural History in Gastonia and defines natural history this way. It's looking at the elements within an environment, including plants, animals, rocks, minerals, soil, air, and human beings, and looking at how those different living and non-living things relate to one another. We're really interested in how things in an environment work, both living and non-living, and how they work together, and how they influence one another. With the definition in hand, the next question is, how did Gastonia, a textile-centric town, become home to a museum holding such a vast collection of natural history specimens and objects? To answer that, we first start in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Born the 2nd of April, 1893, and the son of immigrant parents, Rudolf M. Scheele showed an early interest in the world around him. I know from records, uh, he must have been a very curious child. Even at the age of eight or nine, he was volunteering at what one in Philadelphia at the time was called the Commercial Museum. And it housed a lot of material from all over the world that had been left over from a World's Fair that was held there. He developed an intense uh, interest in paleontology, uh, doing taxidermy to animals, that's where he learned that. So he continued to, to work there uh, all throughout his education. As a young man, Scheele enlisted in the U.S. Army and served as a second lieutenant. When he left the Army, he took a job with the Boy Scouts. He was first posted in Alaska and then he was posted in Kansas. By now we're up to 1924. And this area had a few scout troops, but they didn't have a formal organized scout council. And so in 1924, they hired him, uh, and he came here with his wife, Lily, who's also from Philadelphia, and they set up and made a home and made their life here. Once the couple arrived in Gastonia, Bud Scheele went to work establishing the Piedmont Scout Council, which to this day serves 11 counties and a scout camp that's named after him. They instilled a sense of stewardship, leadership, and a sense of responsibility in a lot of the young people that came through that camp. And many of those young people grew up and stayed in this community. I interviewed a gentleman one time who was way into his 90s, and I said something about Bud Shield to him, and he said, Mr. Shield. He said, I would never have called that man Bud but they loved him and they respected him, but he very much had that military bearing, and he took that military training and bearing into the scouting program, and so straight as an arrow. Even while busy with the scouts, Scheele and his wife always stayed curious about the natural world around them. The Mr. Scheele 
was a naturalist. Mr. Shield traveled the country working for the Boy Scouts of America, and he collected things. He built a natural history collection during the early parts of the 20th century of animal specimens, of plant specimens, of rocks and minerals, some fossils, wildlife photographs. His wife, Lily, was really interested in anthropological collections, so she, uh, especially those of the Southwest, and she would collect uh, all types of things from the indigenous peoples and their communities and they just had lots of things. The Shields amassed a very large collection over the years, so large that many in the community felt it should be on display. And several of them got together and said, we really need to start a museum for Mr. Shield because he has all these things, taxidermy specimens, some of the fossils, some of the minerals, our insect collection, bird egg collection were all things that he had built over his years of teaching with scouting. And so they built a museum, 1,500 square feet, uh, and brought all that material into it, and that's how the museum was started. The museum opened to the public in 1961 and opened up a world to visitors. Mr. Shield had a, a continental focus, and that makes our museum a bit unique in our area. Many museums will focus on their local natural history, their local environment. Here's this museum in Gastonia that looks at North America, the entire continent. And the reason for that was our foundation. Uh, Mr. Shield and Mrs. Shield, they collected things from across the continent. There are a few interesting backstories to some of the animals on display. For the buffalo, Mr. Shield went on a road trip. It was available and he drove all the way out to Fort Sill, Oklahoma and got the buffalo skin and brought it back. So the buffalo's down there today. And sometimes he'd even take his taxidermy work home with him. The polar bear that is on exhibit here uh, was the taxidermy was done in his dining room. So not only was he was his wife Lily, his partner in life and in teaching, she also was very much his partner in allowing a polar bear to be taxidermied in the dining room. As you explore the museum, you can experience a sense of legacy, but also progress. There's a traditional sense about the term natural history, and since so much of our institution here at the Shill Museum is tradition, it's the tradition of Mr. Shill's original collections extending all the way to the modern day in new and exciting approaches to teaching these, these scientific concepts. It's really cool to have a traditional institutional name. The mission of the museum today is to inspire curiosity, is to be here to have objects and relationships with uh, people that are here, a conversation with someone on the floor, uh, going to a program. Um, we're also here to, to provide things that are real uh, in a virtual world. Uh, you can come here and you can see a real elk and you can get about three feet away from it, which is not something you can probably do in a nature preserve or a zoo. So we, we inspire curiosity, we want people to continue to learn, and we hope that they see something here that makes them want to go look it up and learn more about it. Our museum sits on a campus of 20 acres and we have a nature trail and you go past some outdoor exhibits. So not only are you out in nature, but you're walking past uh, a backcountry farm, a replicated Catawba Indian village. It's a very special place and a lot of people come just to walk. It's very hard here to pick a favorite um, part of the collections. When you come to the Shield Museum, well, the first thing you're going to see is a very large dinosaur. So the first thing in the door, you're going to see a T-Rex. Uh, depending on when you come, you may see an art exhibit, but mainly you're going to see exhibits on the natural history of North America. Um, and that's going to include the, the mammals, the birds, rocks, minerals, uh, paleontology. You're also going to see some live animals. Uh, we think it's really important uh, for people to have an experience of actually seeing the animal, not just a picture of it. The sheer volume of Bud and Lily Shield's collection is impressive, but the couple likely never imagined their hobby and passion would serve the public for generations and continue to provide benefits well into the future. Their collections formed the foundation 
but over the last 50 plus years, we have continued to add to those collections based on research and other ways of obtaining objects. We've had people give us things over the years, and we've really added to our research collection, both in entomology, uh, but mainly in archeology. span There's been an ongoing archeological research program here uh, for almost 30 years, and so we know a lot about the history and mainly the prehistory of this region and making them available for study is something that's very important to us. And making them available to the public broadly uh, is also a goal that we have. And that's why we rotate things that are on collections, that are, that are out on display from time to time. Uh, it not only helps to sort of have something new when you come here, you're gonna see something a little bit different. Since the doors first opened in 1961, the museum has continued to strive for relevance, but more importantly, it strives to inspire the next generation. With our mission statement, it's to inspire curiosity with science and the natural world and through our exhibits and programs and research. Um, to me, the Shield Museum is almost a metaphor for uh, the past, present, and future. We know it's really important to listen to people and to listen to our community and pay attention to what people are saying. Uh, and if they're not asking us questions about something, then we might need to really look at that. Maybe we're not challenging people to think about things. And so I think by just paying attention to who, you know, what we're supposed to be doing and who's coming here and what they need um, keep, keeps you relevant. And that's where Tony Paysauer steps in. He first came to the museum as a child with his grandmother. Today, he's the head of interpretation at the museum. Interpretation is the, the presentation of our mission through experiences at the museum, so we have different types of experiences for different types of visitors. In our programs, we like to present different stories from the world of natural science to a variety of audiences. These stories might reflect uh, school science curriculums to students on a school field trip. Well, the stories might be something that really appeals to the general audience that might visit us from across the region. Many visitors like to come see the museum exhibits. They can learn about plants, animals, rocks, minerals, people. One of the reasons that we, we do natural history and people is because we're animals. We're animals too, and we have we have a history, a physical history, we have a cultural history, uh, and we certainly live in a habitat. And so people are very much part of the natural world. And so it's really not any great surprise to find a lot of human culture and material on human culture in a natural history museum. The Henry Hall of the American Indian is filled with Native American artifacts, weapons, and pottery from tribes across the country. Much of it is the result of Lily Shields' own collections. She was always interested in Native American culture, uh, the material culture, and he was interested in anything in the natural world. So that's the heritage that they left uh, to us. Um, she really, really enjoyed uh, Native American arts and crafts. And so every year after they closed up the camp, uh, they would make a trip out west and she would buy things, baskets, uh, jewelry, Navajo rugs, and we have a wonderful collection of materials from that time period that came, that came because of her, her passion. And it's not just items from the Southwest in the Henry Hall. Even though the Catawbas today, uh, their reservation is in South Carolina, in prehistoric and early historic times, the Catawba ranged all the way from here up toward the mountains at Morganton. Catawba pottery is on display in the hall, and along the nature trail, you can step into this recreated Native American village to get a sense of how the Catawba tribe might have lived. The interesting thing about the Catawba is that when Europeans started moving into this area, there was a lot of disruption. And they brought with them, um, not intentionally, but they brought with them diseases that, like influenza and measles uh, and smallpox. And so a lot of the Native American population had no resistance and they were decimated. And with that population decline, a lot of, a lot of the skills and the life ways were lost and they were having to adapt to a new environment. But the Catawba never stopped making pottery in their traditional uh, way of coiling and scraping and, and burning over a wood fire. Dioramas, live animals, and minerals under cases might be the foundation at the Shield, but Paysauer thinks a little differently. 
we have uh, different techniques that we employ today uh, in our exhibits and our programs than we used to. We, we very often will shift with the market as it changes. So we keep our local audience very much in mind when we develop an exhibit idea. There's many companies that can produce exhibit experiences. Uh, there's many resources available to us, but we really believe that we can produce the best product for our local audience if we really build it from the local perspective. We have a featured exhibit right now called Creepy Nature, and uh, it's an immersive experience into travels of one Thaddeus Jones as he goes off out into the, the world to explore all kinds of things that people tell him are true, but he's not really sure whether there are vampire bats or not. And so it's a, it's a different kind of exhibit. We developed this Creepy Nature exhibit concept as a way to teach hard science concepts about invasive species, about changes in environment, um, about animals that possibly prey on other animals, uh, sort of the dark side uh, to the natural world. And it was Paysour who came up with the concept. Yes, I got the idea from uh, looking at a, a very popular uh, geography magazine in a dentist's office, and there was a really cool cover that, that spoke to um, zombies, and it uh, was about, I think it had a ladybug on the cover and the article was illustrated in portions in graphic novel style. It told some hard science stories uh, using art, and I thought that was a really cool approach. Visitors make their way through a windy corridor where they come across various animals, including hissing cockroaches, spiders, and one very large snake. Then around the corner, they meet the Kraken. We wanted to do an element that dealt with sea monsters. And to make it happen, if we just start with a blank page and decide what we might build to teach that concept. So having the expertise in our staff uh, to follow through with ideas that we have, that's a tremendous advantage and that's one that we uh, very often take. My name is Michael Karen, and I am a, an exhibits fabricator for the Shield Museum. I'm trained as a sculptor and uh, I do some sculpting, uh, mold making, uh, painting. I fabricated the Kraken for that exhibit, which is, it's about 15 feet by 15 feet by six feet tall. Uh, I also did a number of anything related to sculpture there. It was a somewhat of a technical challenge because it was so large that there are many avenues there. But there, there are over a thousand suckers on the, on the Kraken, which makes the labor very, very difficult. Now Karen is working on a new project for the Henry Hall of the American Indian. One is a crazy horse who we have nothing but disputed pictures and the drawing of him, so there's an interpretation there. And the other figure is Ishii, who is a, a later figure, uh, one of the last uh, Native Americans to quote unquote come out of the wild. And he's a very recognizable figure, so we need to accurately um, get his features uh, quite precise. This is an additive sculptural process, so I start with a core of some type and then build upon it. A lot of the work early on is with my hands, thumbs, four fingers, uh, but then as, as I get closer to the surface, then it's all tools. I very, very seldom touch it with my hands after a certain point because that just muddies the form. Karen does meticulous research when working on these types of projects. We have to have a, a lot of imagery for me to understand the form of the, of the figures themselves. Historically, there is a lot of importance to these particular figures. But he adds that it's not just an eye for detail that's important, but also immense respect for the culture he's depicting. That is really important that we are not making a caricature of anyone. That's a responsibility that I have in terms of representation. I have a representation to an entire um, uh, I, uh, cultural identity of people. Each tribal distinction is subtle and uh, I do my best to understand that, but I will only be able to capture 
so much of that, but we are we as a natural history museum have a responsibility to to be respectful and to try and represent things as accurately as as the information can be gathered. Not every museum has the opportunity to hire a sculptor. We they tend to be generalists uh, in exhibits, and uh, we have quite a varied workload. And we have some experts in certain fields. I really am lucky uh, to end up uh, being able to do this for a living. Not everything at the museum is inanimate. This is Cornelius. Uh, he is a corn snake. Um, he's not full grown. These guys can get five to six feet long. And they actually get their name. You see the bottom of them? It kind of looks like corn or maize. And so that's one reason why they thought they were named corn snakes. My name is Keely Zimmerman. I'm the live animal manager here at the Shield Museum. So that means I oversee our entire animal collection. Uh, we have over 40 species of animals and over 70 something actual animals here at the museum. Zimmerman believes the animals in her care play a vital role in conservation, giving visitors a better understanding of each animal. And I think when they get a chance to, to meet a live animal or see a live animal exhibit and learn about it, they're more likely to hopefully help respect that animal. And um, they want to learn more about why we, why we need this animal, why we should protect it. The museum often works with wildlife rescue groups, giving a home to animals that can't be released again. I don't feel like it's fair to bring an animal in from the wild that could live on its own. Like They're there for a purpose, and the goal through education is to teach about that purpose. And so we utilize animals that couldn't otherwise survive outside, and so they can help tell their story and hopefully in turn help protect those animals that are outside. They have a variety of reptiles, insects, small mammals, and birds on the inside. And at the farm, they have chickens, sheep, and pigs. One of the latest additions to Zimmerman's care makes their home in what looks like a tiny moon base, Costa Rican leaf cutter ants. What I think is super awesome about them is it's just such a cool thing to look up close at. I mean, you can see them cutting those leaves, you can see them moving them, you can see everything happening step by step by step. So my favorite part is really seeing that like light bulb moment that can, you know, light up and that they, they have that excitement and they have that passion and they really want to make a difference too. And, you know, the next generation is our future. And so getting them excited and hyped up and, and, you know, liking snakes and not wanting to, you know, kill a snake like their parents do or, or maybe just not even being afraid of snakes like their parents or understanding why we have these creatures um, means the world to me. It's, it's really my favorite part of my job. Blending of history, science, and culture are in the DNA of the Shield Museum of Natural History. Whether it's experiencing reenactments on the farm or finding creepy creatures in the dark, those that work here consider it a privilege. I think the most important thing that we can do at the museum is inspire young people to uh, be hungry for knowledge. To come to work and be able to create, to take ideas and transform those ideas into experiences that our citizens, our children, uh, really enjoy and benefit from. So the opportunity to take that, that creative energy and, and make something uh, for, for people to come and learn about, uh, to come and see, to come and do, to be excited to come and, and, and experience that product, that's a really cool uh, part of what I personally get to do. This place is very important in this community. Uh, it would not be here if it hadn't been for the support of this community, which says to me that this is a place that's been fulfilling the, the needs of our families and our students for a very long time, and it's been a great pleasure to be part of that. Mr. Shield left a wonderful gift uh, in his enthusiasm for the natural world and his interest in the natural world. Um, he has been an inspiration to this community, even for those that never knew him and don't know anything about him, in seeing the museum that grew from his original work, from what he and Lily did, from what they loved, from what they collected. This museum uh, has grown and flourished, and the citizens today, many of which are very far removed from the Shields, continue to benefit from their interest and their legacy.
So history isn't just dates, famous world leaders, and world events. It's the interactions in nature, geological events, and how cultures evolve through time. It's the story of how a curious young man and his wife from Philadelphia ended up in Gastonia, and with the help of the community, created a unique natural history museum, a place to explore and imagine what life was like a hundred or even hundreds of years ago, a place that can connect us to our natural history, as only the Shield Museum can. of PBS Charlotte.